Hello, welcome to the Wistar Institute Imaging Core Facility. My name is Jamie Hayden, and in this video we're going to be taking a look at the Leica SP5 laser scanning confocal microscope. Before we get started, a few ground rules. In this day of COVID, masks are mandatory. On the other hand, this is a small room. You can close the door, and if you're in here by yourself, you do have the opportunity to take it down. This will be helpful for us because you'll be able to understand me better, and my glasses won't be fogging up. In addition, you must be wearing a fresh pair of gloves. Now, I don't mean a pair of gloves that you were wearing back in the lab before you came down here. I mean a fresh pair that you either brought with you uh, or a pair that you could be getting from us. We have whatever size you need on hand. In addition, you'll also notice that there's some other safety things that are on the microscope, including the plastic over the oculars. There will also be plastic over some of the touchscreen uh, items, but uh, for here at least, I need to leave it off so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, there's also plastic on the keyboards and the mouse and other commonly touched areas. Now, we're going to make a small assumption here, uh, and that is that you're the first person of the day to come in and use this microscope. However, you don't really know what it's going to be when you first come here. It might be that somebody has used it before you. We're going to go through the entire startup procedure here, at least, and make sure that you know what buttons need to be pushed and how to get started. So uh, let's begin. Okay, so before we get started, it's a good idea to review why you might want to use the confocal microscope in the first place. The confocal is a more complicated instrument and it requires a bit more investment in time and money to use it, and so you want to make sure that you're using it for the right reasons. For this system, one of the good reasons for using it is because of its spectral capabilities. If you have two fluorophores that are particularly close together and interfering with each other, overlap, bleed through, that sort of thing, this is a great system to keep them separated, so spectral separation. The second good reason for using it has to do with the way confocals work. You're actually focusing visually through a cell or some other material, and you're creating very thin sections. These sections are clear and sharp, and especially at higher magnifications, give you a better image than you would get with a wide field system. And then the third reason has to do with those thin sections. You can actually create a 3D reconstruction of your cell by taking a stack of those images and working them through the system. So assuming that you do have something that is appropriate for use with this, let's get started and turn things on. So when you first walk through the room, you don't know if the instrument has been turned on or not. As I mentioned, we're going to assume you're the first person of the day to use it. When I first come in, I like to take a look at everything, start at the left, work my way to the right, make sure everything is turned on and in the right position. The first thing that you're going to notice when you come in here is it's a little bit chilly. That's for the lasers. The lasers do need to keep it cold in here in order to function properly. If you are cold, make sure that you're wearing long sleeves or bring a lab coat with you, but please do not adjust the thermostat. Underneath the thermostat on the wall, though, there is a light switch, and the light switch, of course, allows you to turn the lights on and off, but there's also a little slider next to it which allows you to adjust it in between. Confocal, of course, is a fluorescence uh, system, and so most of the time you're going to do this with the lights out, but I'm going to leave things on so you can see what I'm doing today. You'll also notice that we have an environmental chamber around our microscope. This is in case you're working with live cells. Primarily, this system is used for slides, but every once in a while somebody does need to use it for live cells, and so we need to make sure that we have heat and CO2 and all the things that are required for keeping your cells happy. So the components for doing that are all over here, either up on the shelf or behind me here down on the bottom. So let me show you what we've got. So here we have our homemade gas mixing chamber, which takes the house medical air and CO2, runs it through these flow meters, and gives us 5% CO2 to send into the microscope. Up on the shelf, the CO2 detector is going to tell you what the CO2 percentage is. It's set to 5%, but as long as that green light is on, you know that you're within range. Range is between 4.5% and 5.5%, and that's acceptable for your cells. Over to the side here, you also see this big blue cube. This is our heater. If it is turned on, you're going to see numbers in here telling you what the temperature is. If it's turned off like it is now, you won't see anything. Our basic rule with the temperature block is that if it is turned on, you want to leave it on. If it's turned off, you want to leave it off. So the reason for that policy is because of what happens inside the chamber when you turn the heater on or off. 
It takes about six hours for the temperature to stabilize inside, and during that time you're going to have a problem with what's called Z-drift, which is essentially the focus going in and out, up and down. So you want to make sure to tell us if you're going to be working with live cells so that we can turn the heater on the day before, and that way everything is nice and stable when you come in. If you're using slides, it doesn't matter if it's turned on or off because that's not going to affect your slides. But make sure that you do not turn it off because if you do, during that whole time it's going to be cooling and you're going to have that Z-drift problem. You notice also that in the front we have these really floppy openings. That's okay for the temperature. The temperature will stay fine in there. For the CO2 we have this additional chamber that goes inside there. So it comes from the chamber outside to the chamber inside to keep our CO2 happy. Okay, so to continue over here, we're going to be looking at the next thing. Moving to the right of the microscope, you're going to see this Leica XYZ controller, affectionately called the salt and pepper shaker. You'll be using this to control both the X and Y movements of the stage, as well as some of the Z axis focusing. On the left side, you can see two buttons. The one in the front is for coarse, and the one in the back is for fine. Click down on the course to get started, and then you can move the X and Y stage around using the front two controllers. Once your specimen is in place, switch to the Find button for better movement. The buttons on the right are also coarse in the front and fine in the back. These are for the Z axis focusing. You will not be using the focusing knobs on the microscope. Instead, you're going to be using this. So again, focus is, is coarse in the front and fine in the back. Behind the controller is the fluorescence light source for when you are looking into the microscope by eye. Confocal uses lasers, so you can't look at that light. You use this instead to find and do that initial focus on your specimen. The first person of the day will switch it on to start. Notice the big knob in front. This is an aperture dial that lets through either more or less light. Remember that even this light can potentially bleach your specimen, so you should keep it closed down as much as you can to avoid quenching your slides. The aperture is closed when it is all the way up. I like to keep it at two clicks down from that. In addition, notice that there's a square black button to the lower left. It has two positions. Pushed in means that the shutter is open and all the light is going to the microscope. The yellow light comes on in this case. The position it needs to stay in for us is in the remote position. Push the button, it comes out, and the yellow light goes off. Now all of the control comes from the microscope. Once we've made sure that the fluorescence light source is on and it's in the remote position, we'll turn our attention to these green switches down here. The first switch turns on the microscope body and the computer at the same time. Think of this as a power strip. If you accidentally hit this switch when it's running, it's like yanking the plug out, and that's not good for the computer. Be careful, this has happened before. The second switch is for some internal electronics, and the third switch says laser power. There's several places in the startup procedure that include laser power. This is just the first one. If any of them are turned off, you won't get any light. So let's turn them on in order. Things are about to get pretty loud. First, turn on the one, second, and then third. And then turn the key about a quarter turn to the right until the yellow light comes on. Once the computer is started up, click on TCS user, put in the password, and wait for everything to start up. One of the things that you'll see right at the beginning is this black box. Make sure that it continues and does its whole job and turns off before you do anything else. This is connecting to the servers and making sure that we're not having any interruptions or any problems with that. The next thing you want to do is make sure to click into iLab. To do that, just double click on the Chrome icon, which is in the top right hand corner. This will bring you directly to iLab and then that way you can sign in uh, and be responsible for your time. If it automatically starts up, you'll see Teams next. If not, you can always click on it over in the side here, or it's pinned to the bottom. If you need to communicate with any of us while you're working in here, this is going to be the way to do it. Now it's time to start up the Leica LASAF software. Over on the left, the icon is the one in the middle with the red and the white. Double click. 
there's going to be a few pause points while you start up the software and you'll need to check a few things during this process. The first screen that comes up has three things on it that you'll need to check. The system starts up with the initial settings that it last ended with and it's very possible that the last person was doing something different in here than you're going to want to do. You need to make sure these are all set the way you need them. First, check under the configuration tab. You want to make sure that it's set for machine. If the last person used simulator, that would be selected instead. To the right of this, make sure that the microscope stand is set to DMI 6000. If it's set to manual, it won't connect to any hardware when we start up. Last, take a look at the Activate Resonance Scanner. The Resonance Scanner is an ultra-fast scanner that's used for live cells. We don't want to use it. If it's checked like this, make sure to uncheck it. Now once you've looked at all three of those things, it's okay to go ahead and hit the OK button and keep going. Once you've started up the software, it will continue until it gets to another pause point. Here it's asking, do you want to initialize the stage? Initializing the stage allows you to mark locations and come back to them again, or do stitching or that sort of thing. If you're not going to be doing any of that, I want you to hit no when it asks if you want to initialize. If you are going to do one of those things, then you'll be hitting yes. But before you do that, I need to give you a little warning and save you a little bit of money. Several years ago, we had this objective in there. And what happens when you initialize the stage is it starts moving. And anything that gets in the way gets run over. This lens got run over and it got scratched and it only took about $8,000 to fix it. So be careful, let me show you how to avoid it. If you can, always hit no. Do not initialize the stage. So if you're anything like me, your brain's gonna say no and your finger's gonna slip and hit yes anyway. So there's a couple things that I want you to check to make sure that everything's out of the way just in case the stage does initialize. First, this is what I call the condenser stock. The condenser is on here. You want to make sure that it's not sticking down into the pathway. So just take it and tilt it backwards. Make sure to hold on to it so it doesn't fall back. Next, there's some buttons down here. We want to make sure there are no objectives sticking up through the stage, like that one that got scratched. So we need to make sure that the objectives are all lowered as far as they can away from the stage. Look for these three buttons on the side of the microscope, and this is how we'll do it. If you push and hold the very bottom button, it will retract the lens all the way to the bottom. You can confirm this by looking on the front panel, and it's going to tell you what the Z position is. It tells you minus 4.30 millimeters, and that's about as low as it's going to get. The third thing to look for is the oil. Make sure that any oil inside the chamber is out of the way of the stage so it doesn't accidentally get knocked over. Down here on the bottom is where it should be kept. Now that you've checked those, it's time to move forward in the software. Remember to tilt back the condenser, lower the objectives, and move the oil out of the way. Okay, at this point you can go ahead and hit no to the question of whether or not you want to initialize the stage. Unless you absolutely need it, always hit no. Now, for purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to hit yes just to show you what happens. So this is what happens if you hit yes. The stage moves to the four corners and stops in the middle. Anything that's in the way is going to get run over or crushed. After the stage initialization, the software continues to this point, which is its initial startup screen. In part two of our videos, we're going to take a look at the details that you need to know for putting a slide on the stage and finding something to image.